Hey everyone. Welcome to the Uniting America podcast presented to you by Braver Angels. I'm Braver Angels National Ambassador and your host, John Wood Jr. This is your doorway into the movement to save the Republic, the movement to realize the dream of Martin Luther King. Join us. This is the movement to build a house united. Here we are, episode one. I couldn't be more pleased to welcome Sam Harris to the opening edition of Uniting America. Sam is a philosopher, neuroscientist, author, host of the Making Sense podcast, and one of the foremost public intellectuals in the United States, if not the world. In this conversation, Sam and I talked about his unwillingness to publicly debate proponents of the stolen election claim and skeptics of the COVID-19 vaccine. In that latter vein, we do talk about our mutual friend, Brett Weinstein, one of the most prominent skeptics of our public health response to COVID, and the reasons why Sam chose not to engage Brett publicly. But at its heart, our conversation was about the larger project of intellectual persuasion, one that it was my purpose to try and reframe for Sam not as merely a project of direct intellectual engagement, but principally a project of rebuilding social trust across far-reaching networks of people who think differently from one another. In this context, we revisit the intellectual dark web, consider what opportunities may have been lost in its collapse, and place our bets on what the most likely paths are towards rehabilitating our political society in the future. In agreement and disagreement, Sam is a role model for me and many others, one with whom it was an honor to speak. And now I give you Sam Harris. Sam Harris, welcome to Uniting America. How are you, my friend? Thank you, John. Great to be here. Yeah, no, it really is. It really is great to, great to welcome you. Um, you know, I, I'm at the the point in my um, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, career and uh, sort of experience as a as a marginal public figure to where I've had the opportunity to uh, to meet and discourse with a number of folks who have been uh, very much influential uh, on me uh, over over time, and that's always a, a special feeling. Uh, even at that. Though uh, getting the opportunity to share some mic time with you sort of stands out, you know, in the in the spectrum of those experiences, and so uh, that's a reception I imagine you get uh, a fair amount. Uh, but I did want to take a a quick moment to sort of articulate that for you here. Oh well, I, I'm I've long admired your voice uh, from afar, but this is the first time we've spoken on the phone before. But I think yeah. it's the first public facing conversation. So yeah, it's great, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, well, yeah, likewise, likewise. So, Sam, um, I wanted to sort of um, frame our conversation up in this way. Um, I think that you and I both have a deep commitment to the idea that through conversation, we can create the space by which individuals, but perhaps through the interactions of individuals, groups uh, and and uh, parts of our society coming from variously sort of differing starting points can in more ideal scenarios sort of arrive at a place to where they can reason together towards truth and a clear understanding of reality and its myriad uh dimensions and i think that so much of your uh, cultural impact uh derives from the fact that whether you're somebody who's coming from well to the left or well to the right or dead center, however you're located on the ideological spectrum, if we are coming from a place of good faith, it I think at least tends to be the case that we would like to believe in the idea that uh, reason is something that can transcend um, our our differences. Maybe that's not a universally held conviction among people of good faith, but it it seems like a pretty fundamental sort of liberal starting point. Uh, would you would you tend to agree with that? Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, obviously our disappointments on that front are legion at this point. So it's it's not a perfect tool, but I would agree that it it is um, really the only tool we have to persuade people who are uh, the the only valid tool we have. To persuade people who are who are far apart, right, right, and you know, I mean, obviously, there's there's more going on. There's you know, there's there's solidarity, there's love, there's other forces that that um, 
keep people together and their and their opposites push people apart and make and make your reasoning that much more difficult but um you know even among people who you know already love one another and already are aligned you know ideologically in all kinds of ways and have no reason to to um not be able to cooperate the it's the it's the layer of rationality that is the thing that should be getting them to converge on you know common projects and agree about facts and and to just just figure out how to navigate in the space of 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 risk and uncertainty and so it's not you know love and solidarity and and political alignment can do the work of reason where they shouldn't um and reason can fail to do the work it should do when people are too far apart emotionally right so it's not mm-hmm. it's not perfect but it really is the right tool for the job right right so reason in conversation becomes perhaps um you know a a necessary but perhaps not entirely sufficient uh sort of tool in the box uh when it comes yeah. to right yeah. comes to this question you know how do we how do we um sort of perfect or even just make marginally functional the project of self-governance in a, you know, in a, in a free society, a society that aspires to be, you know, responsibly free. Um, and so I think that part of the tension that, that, that may potentially lie uh, between you and I may be, if not a, it, it may be that there's a differing sort of degree of confidence that we have in the potential of conversation to be sort of a useful tool across sort of a certain spectrum of political disagreements that may exist between people depending on the context or or it may be something finer tuned than 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 that um here's what i want to put on the table you uh i i went back and listened to um uh some of your old um old material actually in particular you know i listened to a conversation that you had i'm not sure what the context was this video is uh, a good number of years old but i listened to a conversation you had with jonathan Haidt in front of uh, a, a number of other uh, professors and, and and academics uh that uh sort of got into well it was discussing the moral landscape of course you wrote a book called the moral landscape and you know this question was can science inform uh, and help us sort of determine or at least recognize moral uh moral truths it's probably an imperfect way of summarizing your mm. your your position there but leans in the right direction and you put forward the idea that there are sort of three projects associated with morality and if i if i recall correctly You know, the first was sort of taking a sort of a historical and social inventory of what people sort of mean by the term morality. The the second was, I I think, sort of, you know, uh, looking into, you know, uh, given the idea that morality means something, how does that actually sort of show up and manifest in in, in, uh, in human human well-being? Uh, But the third project I, I recall you identifying was this project having to do with sort of moral persuasion how can we actually sort of persuade people to kind of live and act in a direction that aspires to what we can uh, perhaps say to be true about you know what really constitutes you know uh, moral truth and a good life and human well-being and human flourishing and I, I seem to recall you identifying that as the most important project of of the three uh, first of all, am I am I doing a reasonable enough job of sort of summarizing those points? And second of all, uh, in in your estimation, is that persuasion project still at the top of the list in terms of mm. where we ought to be focusing our our intellectual and uh, moral energies here? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I remember the conversation with Height that you're you're referencing, but I but I, I think what I would have likely said in that context is that there are distinct projects. Uh, one is just to, to take three here is slightly different than what you suggested, but um, I mean, one is to understand what people mean by morality and people, you know, on my account, they mean many things they shouldn't mean by that term. There, mm-hmm. there are pseudo moralities out there that we should ultimately disregard, um, you know, and many, many of those arise in a religious context. Uh, so, mm-hmm. you know, for in certain parts of the world, burning the Quran is the most important thing you could do uh to the 
to, that that's wrong. And, you know, that obviously I, I don't think burning the Quran has as many or even any moral implications um, or any other burning any, any other book for that matter. But um, I think that the biggest difference between between m- my approach and then the normal you know the standard scientific approach to in understanding morality is science generally approaches it as an evolved set of capacities you know we make moral judgments we have strong you know feelings of of disgust in response to certain human behaviors and we want to understand all that psychologically and we've evolved these tendencies to moralize and they um we've evolved this way for a reason and we can understand all of that biologically and and neuropsychologically and and you know, psychologically and every other other uh you know flavor of inquiry you you, you want to add to that uh and that would that would be the totality of what we could descriptively say is true about morality for human beings from a scientific point of view what i was mm-hmm. arguing for in the moral landscape is that there's a there's a distinct project from all of that, it's not to disregard the the importance or the intellectual interest of of doing that descriptive project, but there's another project which is very much you know could be very much founded on on science again in in multiple branches, and it's the project of trying to figure out just what we should do next, right? Given what's possible, what is possible for minds like our own, and what is possible for minds that we may one day have if we augment ourselves or change ourselves in, in in ways that technology will is is now and will will soon uh make possible right mm-hmm. so um just how good human life just how good could this this life of ours get you know there there are answers to the questions of that sort and they are they're answers that again would come from psychology and neuroscience and and uh you know other branches of of, of you know rationality generally construed but there's this yes there's this this extra piece, which is the variable of persuasion, right? But just how yeah. is it that we change yeah. people's minds, and we, you know what what should we what should we persuade people to think and believe and want? Uh, you know, if we can change our values and the values of other people, how should we change them? You know, what is what is how do we? I, I view morality generally as a a navigation problem. You know, we're we're trying to mm-hmm. navigate in the space of all possible experience. Both individually yeah. and collectively, and and to navigate collectively, we have to be able to persuade one another that we should go over here as opposed to over there. And um, and if we can't persuade one another, we have nothing to appeal to other than force. Really, I mean that that becomes the political right. problem of coercing people who are uh, you know, unpersuadable. And um, so we get you know if we want to have less violence in our lives we need to get better and better at converging through conversation so yeah i i i I think i i share your hope that conversation is something that we will ultimately rely on more and more and more and uh moments of coercion will um seem uh more and more bizarre to us and unnecessary i mean that that's what Mm. human progress would look like if we if we continue to make it Right. So the idea of navigation feels like a useful kind of um, uh, term here for sort of describing what this is, what this is like. Um, so at Braver Angels, you know, there is a degree to which uh, our mission is to establish the context in which persuasion is possible in society. I don't think we we don't typically sort of define or describe our mission in terms of seeking to allow people to persuade one another sort of first and foremost, because the fundamental sort of layer, uh, to my mind, that seems to be prerequisite to the possibility of persuasion in democratic discourse uh, begins with something that you might describe as social trust or civic trust. This, This idea that between you know, uh, between citizens who have, you know, disagreements that there nevertheless is sort of some fundamental sense, whether it's through shared identity, uh, shared, you know, sort of um, belief in the idea that, well, you know, this other party may be wrong, but, you know, they don't necessarily mean me ill. I have emotional and psychological permission to listen to what the other side is saying. And that sort of makes it possible for us to go back and forth and 
in dialectic. Um, on the eve of the uh, uh, 2020 election afterwards, well, I guess for, I mean, you, you would be best to sort of refresh my memory on the timeline, but I think that you, you, you surprised a number of people by uh, not wanting to sort of engage in conversation on two topics in, in, in particular, as I, as I recall. Um, one was, um, you know, what folks can, you know, refer to, of course, as, as the big lie, but this idea that the 2020 election was stolen through voter fraud and, you know, full transparency. I mean, you and I would not disagree in terms of our, our feelings about that, uh, position as a matter of truth and so forth. And also, uh, skepticism with respect to the COVID-19, uh, vaccines and sort of the, you know, perhaps, um, you know, the, the feeling that, that some, uh, people, including, you know, uh, mutual, uh, friends and acquaintances of, of, of ours who took strong positions, sort of sowing distrust in the, uh, in the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine at a moment of great public health risk. Uh, those were conversations that you tended not to want to have, uh, yeah. in, in, in public. Um, and, um, uh, I, on the other hand, at at Braver Angels, um, we did make the decision to allow for public debate on the voter fraud issue uh, in in particular. Now, this was after the the 2020 election. Um, And I think it was largely a matter of circumstance and capacity that we didn't play host to that sort of a conversation, you know, prior to the inauguration of, of President Biden. I say after the 2020 election, I mean after the, the inauguration as well. We, we, we started to hold programming uh, in, in, I think, in the spring of that year. It was terribly controversial. We had many members quit, many people who were upset uh, at us uh, for having done so. My position, though, uh, was that ultimately the part of the price of living in a democratic society is that If we are going to set the stage for social trust to exist across tense disagreements, we have to allow room for people to be able to show up with their errors, right? And let me be clear, Brave Angels does not take a policy position in and of itself. I can take a position, right? But as an organization, we are led by folks who are Democrats, Republicans, including Trump supporters and social justice activists, et cetera. So I just want to make sure there's no um, confusion on that front. But it has seemed to me that we have to ultimately be willing um, to allow for people to make the make the points and positions that they believe in without great prejudices to not only whether they're right or wrong or even whether or not their points of view derive from a solid grasp of whatever the whatever the uh, material facts may be, in part. Because it seems that social distrust is intensified when you cut that opportunity out. Because people tend to jump to the conclusion that says that, well, you know, um, I uh, must be on to something uh, here because uh, clearly the powers that be don't want to, you know, don't want to allow for my point of view to be heard. But on the other hand, when you bring people into a space where they have the opportunity to sort of compare perspectives, it allows for the possibility that erroneous narratives can be interrupted if that layer of social trust is there to facilitate sort of, you know, sort of a, an opening of ears. And so we construct our programs and, and our uh, methodologies so as to uh, allow for that to be the case, uh, ideally. So I, I guess my question here is your, um, your uh, decision not to talk about these issues uh, in in uh, public ways, uh, at the time, was that, was that a decision that was rooted in sort of a, uh, an immediate sense that the context of the moment was not, w- was not, uh, amenable to that being, um, being, um, uh, a profitable sort of decision? In other words, was it just the fact that the public health crisis was intense uh at the time and that democracy was under immediate threat and therefore you didn't want to hold those conversations or is that a more principled refusal in these two particular uh in the case of these two particular subjects to be able to engage in that sort of discourse at any time uh at 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 all um how, how would you define the context of those decisions well i think it was a bit of both 
um, first to, to clarify, I did talk about those issues. I just didn't talk about them in the way that people, the people who were on the other side of those issues wanted me to. Right. So I didn't, I didn't, right. I didn't debate a, a vaccine skeptic on my podcast. And I didn't, I didn't debate somebody who believed that in the big lie on, on my podcast. So, so, so in the same way that, you know, I, I, I might not debate, I mean, there's, there's a couple of variables here. There's a kind of a, an asymmetric property of information warfare here. It's like, mm -hmm. it, it takes very little energy to make a mess and it takes a lot of energy to clean it up. Uh, and this is true mm -hmm. in the real world. I mean, this is true with terrorism. It's true with, you know, real, you know, asymmetric warfare, guerrilla warfare. Um, it's very hard to prevent every act of, of, uh, of terrorism is in incredibly costly and it's, you know, very expensive. It, it's, it's not, not costly at all to, to actually bring off a successful act of terrorism. Uh, mm -hmm. so you have an asymmetry with respect to information. Uh, and there's also a, um, there's a structure to conspiracy thinking that is, is, is fairly generalizable, which makes it, um, a, a truly thankless job to engage in real time in debate, right? I mean, so certain things are not effectively debatable and to platform them as debates gives a, a, uh, an erroneous picture of just how uncertain, uh, qualified people are on that given topic. Like, so to bring on, to take us out of these controversial issues for a moment, just to, to illustrate the point. Yeah. You know, I never had a 9-11 truth conspiracy person on my podcast. I spent a lot of time talking about 9-11, reacting to 9-11. You know, I spent a lot of time focused on terrorism, jihadism. And, but, you know, there are people, yeah. obviously, who think that 9-11 had nothing to do with terrorism or jihadism. This was a self-inflicted wound by psychopaths in our own government. And and there, there are many flavors of this conspiracy theory. But, you know, they, they include people who believe that this was all done by the CIA and the Bush administration and there are you know hundreds or even thousands of psychopaths employed by the u.s government who were willing on on that september morning to kill three thousand innocent uh, neighbors uh right. and those buildings had been rigged to explode and you know uh, and if you wade into this morass of that i consider you know truly delusional right mm. uh there's it's impossible to play whack-a-mole fast enough, assiduously enough, long enough with these, these truly disconnected theses, right? That, mm -hmm. um, that you're going to satisfy the people who are convinced of this conspiracy theory, right? I mean, these people who think mm -hmm. that the CIA had voice faking technology. So the, the cell phone messages, the, the voicemail messages from this, you know, from the cell phone calls on some of those doomed planes, you know, where, you know, your uh, wife is literally getting her husband's voice on voicemails saying, you know, it looks like we're, we're going to die. Uh, I love you. Right. All that's fake with, with magical CIA, you know, deep fake technology that they had in, in, you know, 22 years ago, 21 years ago. Um, so yes, yeah, so I have made it a, I've made a determination that talking to someone who believes that is a fool's errand. Right, that that mm. conversation isn't good enough, it, it, and certainly conversation in specific forums isn't good enough. Right, there's no there's no one who believes any of that stuff who's going to change his or her mind in real time on my podcast. Right, no mm. matter what I hit him with, I mean, it's just it like and it and the amount of research and engagement in kind of pseudo topics in order to even have that conversation adequately, so that I, I don't even, I don't embarrass myself in front right. of. The, the, you know, it's like, if, you know, if I, if I don't know the actual melting point of steel and how hot mm -hmm. thermite burns, right. Sure. I'm off by a hundred degrees. Right. I have completely mm -hmm. disqualified myself as a, as a voice of anything rational on that topic for nine 11 truth right. conspiracy theorists. So there's an analogous thing happening in Trumpistan around election fraud. There's an analogous mm -hmm. thing happening with, with COVID, uh, vaccine skeptics. Um, now it's, so on the topic of the vaccine, I'd be the first to admit that that has 
always been a moving target, right? And there has been, at, at many stages along the way, it has been rational to be concerned about various instances of, of public health messaging that clearly got politicized. The CDC has, you know, embarrassed itself in the way that it has, um, uh, you know, cut corners, you know, and shaded the truth. I mean, it's just all of that is has been a gift to the enemies of of the the central claim that these vaccines are are um, you know uh, w- broadly safe and worth taking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, given that it's a moving target, there has been at various stages along the way uh, more and more to talk about. And you know, I'm not. It's not that I would never, you know, enter. You know, yes, it's completely rational to talk about at the you know at this moment when when we have a the basic shape of the pandemic is understood. And we know mm-hmm. how lethal it because because when I was really reluctant to do this was when we just really didn't know what we were in st- what was in store for us right we didn't know how right. lethal it was we yeah. didn't know how many people how many millions of people were were going to die at that point and um and there was no evidence and then there still is no evidence that the the vaccine was uh, dangerous enough to to be as dangerous as as getting co as getting COVID unvaccinated for. Uh, virtually every cohort, but now, yeah, now if you're you're talking about a CDC that is mandating that that teenage boys get a a fourth dose of the vaccine, um, and mm-hmm. and they're unwilling to discuss the risk of myocarditis, well, yes, then now there's a a moment of a fine, you know, a cost cost benefit analysis that that needs to be done by rational people. But this is just a very different moment that we're in now than than what you know went you know a year ago or you know a year and a half ago when this was an excruciating concern for people right right well i'm glad that you remarked on the context of the uh, of the moment at the time as as well as the context of perhaps some of the limitations that you felt with respect to the platform that you were operating on um i do think though that um well so if it it would be difficult for me, however, to sort of endorse a principled sort of, you know, refusal to sort of commit uh, to, to sort of engage in discussion on those topics and sort of in any and all scenarios. Um, and it, it sounds to me like you're perhaps uh, uh, sort of uh, amenable, depending on depending on context to, to some approach in that direction. I, I feel like I've heard you say things and uh, make noises and sort of different uh, sort of hinting at that possibility maybe but i want to zoom out a little bit from the narrow context of sort of you know your role as a podcaster and and a public intellectual to this larger sort of project of persuasion because what seems to me to be the 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 thing the price that's inevitably sort of incurred i think even through a perhaps um a um uh a, a justifiable uh, sort of contextual decision not to talk about certain topics at a moment of high social risk mm-hmm. is sort of ensuring the fact that there will be sort of this this kind of in, inflaming of you know larger public distrust uh, in 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 those institutions and influential individuals and so forth who are at least are are, are seen as not wanting to engage in a certain in a certain topic and uh, I want I want to. I want to drill into this a little bit because it seems like the um, the way forward, if we're going to arrive at a place where our sort of aggregate sense making capacity is is able to expand uh, and uh, upon what I think would need to be sort of an expanding sort of uh, soil bed of of public trust. Um, actually sort of building out the relational networks by which that can be accomplished, I think becomes sort of a foremost sort of part of the, part of the, the project. Um, And um, in, 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 in light of, in, in, in light of that, um, it, it causes me to sort of want to reflect a little bit on what has been lost in various places with the dissolution of certain uh, sort of networks of of conversation uh, wherein there at a certain point in time 
seem to be sort of a, a convergence of of heterodox thinking that sort of brought in to, to discussion and conversation people from across a wide range of perspectives in a way that uh, for many folks, I think, represented the possibility of there being a positive kind of cultural shift in the direction of normalizing, you know, conversation uh, across uh, stretches that didn't use, that you don't always take for granted is going to be the case. Um, and 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 us having sort of come to a moment in time now where I think we're desperately needing to sort of build and institutionalize potentially networks that preserve that for the to, in order to preserve the possibility that um, collective sense making can reemerge. So, you know, we don't have to dwell on this label here, uh, but I am a person who, to a certain degree, and even, you know, uh, other folks involved in Brave Angels, depolarization work. There are many of us who sort of took uh, inspiration from, you know, the intellectual dark web and what that sort of felt like it might uh, have the potential to become at the time. Again, we don't we don't have to we don't have to uh, to, to dwell on that in particular. Mm -hmm. But I'm I, but I'm attempting to sort of steer our understanding of the persuasion problem towards an understanding of it that identifies it as in part the difficulty that comes with constructing networks that are able to reach across a wide sort of you know spectrum of social ideological distance just how just how hard that is right and how uh, how important it is to try and again just abstracting you know putting aside the idw phenomenon in particular but how important it becomes to sort of you know to try and build that sort of that sort of uh, um, social stitching across across this wide range of of uh, ideological and social separation, in America, and, and to then turn preserve it. Um, I was reading in uh, I know you're familiar with um, I think it's the, the Tower in the Square, Neil Neil Ferguson, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you you, you talked, yeah. and um, you know he. Uh, uh, he, he, there's some interesting material in there about uh, Paul Revere, and folks are you know familiar with uh, you know Revere's uh, uh, ride where he you know warned folks uh, in and around Boston that you know the attacks, the British attacks, were imminent on Lexington and Concord and so forth. And part of the reason the word was able to spread so quickly as a result of Revere's riding was not just because he was on a fast horse, but Revere was somebody who happened to be networked in a way to where he uh, had relationships with folks who themselves were, you know, degree of separation removed from the people uh, by whom information could travel quickly. And it made him a pivotal sort of figure in being able to sort of stitch together the revolutionary energy that helped bind people sort of across classes and across differing associations in, in, in Boston that sort of you know, helped uh, uh, energize this larger movement. Uh, part of what, uh, uh, that larger sort of movement towards revolution, part of what Ferguson talks about in that context is sort of this question of, you know, how influential were the Freemasons, let's say, in setting the stage for the Revolutionary War? And, you know, there's sort of a popular sense that the founders were all, you know, Freemasons, and therefore, yes, the, you know, it's pivotal. There's a more educated understanding that recognizes that actually only about 8% of these folks were Freemasons, so maybe it was marginal, but the point that Ferguson uh, uh, cites and I think makes himself is that, you know, the thing about the Freemasons uh, who were uh, in, a, in a leading position uh, in that moment was that they just, they happened to be networked in such a way to where even as there were fewer of them, you know, even as only several signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons, Benjamin Franklin and Patrick Henry, you know, being a couple of them were networked in a way to where they were able to facilitate the interaction of larger groups within the, the greater sort of colonial society such that, you know, as, as sort of, you know, uh, as, 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 as pivotal figures, they were able to help foster that, that greater uh, culture of dialogue, debate, collaboration, ultimately the maintenance of civic and social trust through their own persons in some sense, because they had credibility across that, that spectrum. Um, the, the, the Braver Angels project is, is one that seeks to ultimately sort of build out the network structures 
in a way that is able to cross partisan divisions and also, you know, demographic uh, differences in geography and so forth, and to span institutional uh, distances in a way that allows us to hopefully putting people uh, uh, into the conversation with e- with each other and through programs and workshops that sort of educate us in, in more uh, constructive ways of discoursing, dialoguing, but also non-tribal ways of thinking about one another, right, irrespective of our political labels, that we might be able to build sort of a, a structure in society uh, that is able to sort of renormalize empathy and civic trust in a way that cross-pollinates across institutions and across demographic and, and ideological sort of uh, 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 spectrums. And um, th- that, that project, to me, um, is, is one that is, 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 is one that uh, exists in a larger social context within which I feel like there are not many uh, folks and forces in society that recognize the need to actually sort of formalize our commitment to building out relational social networks that cross these th- that cross this wide terrain of of difference in a way as providing the sort of fundamental kind of you know footing upon which we can return to 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 uh, functioning reasoning discourse in democratic society what the impulse seems to be is one that says that if only we can marshal enough in the way of facts if, if only we can sort of push out the people who are prone to conspiratorial notions and make sure that the mainstream outlets are constantly sort of beaming down you know rock solid empirical information on people even as more and more people tune out those channels of information that that is our best bet for ultimately stabilizing democratic society, when to my vantage point, that almost guarantees its collapse because it makes zero investment in the trust uh, and the soil of trust that has to undergird, I think, sort of the, re-norm- re-norm- uh, the renorming, if you will, of our, of our civic discourse through these networks that have to be built out. So I've put an awful lot in front of you, Sam, but I wanted to present you with sort of an alternative kind of understanding of what the project of advancing our capacity for persuasion perhaps actually looks like uh, in this moment. And to sort of get your take, uh, you know, sort of one on that master analysis, if you will, and two on the difficulty that perhaps faces us, uh, assuming that you agree that this is desirable, uh, in an effort to stitch together seriously sort of heterodox uh, and ultimately sort of cross-tribal, if you will, uh, networks of relationships and norms in an effort to ultimately uh, repair the tears uh, in the social fabric sufficient to sort of maintain the functioning of our institutions. Well, maybe we have to bring back the Freemasons. Maybe that's the, <laughs> maybe that's the master stroke. Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot going on there. I mean, one is the, the in many cases, well-earned distrust of institutions, right? Our institutions right. have failed us to an impressive degree and been politicized uh, to a degree that um, is obviously dysfunctional and uh, understandably creates a loss of trust. And, you know, some people are, are never coming back to the New York Times and, and CNN and Harvard and in nature and science, and uh, you know, you just extract, add to the list of however you want in, in, in multiple directions. Um, you know, they they've mainstream the gatekeepers of of facts uh, have lost credibility for an enormous number of people, in in not, not just in America, but but globally speaking. Yeah. Um, and that's the. Uh, that's a problem. It's, a, it's certainly a problem in a, when a, uh, the next global pandemic kicks off, right? And we have to get on the same page about health policy and you know what's going on and what's uh, what's the source of this virus and just how bad is it and uh, who did this to us and how should we respond? And like all all of this, if if no one trusts what they read in any newspaper or they only trust what, you know what their 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 curated um, echo chamber of blogs and and Substack newsletters and 
podcast, uh, our epistemology is going to be so fragmented that we we just have a coordination problem we can't solve, right? And so, Precisely. so that's um, so I, I I don't know quite how we reboot. I think our institutions. I, I I don't you know we can't run this by podcast and and newsletter, right? We, we do need institutions. We need right. sources of information that are credible enough such that we're everyone isn't tempted at all times to quote do their own research right i mean this, this mm. doing your own research thing is it's not that it's never appropriate but it is in most cases that just uh you know the the essence of a fool's errand right you're not going mm. to become an immunologist and an epidemiologist and an oncologist and an engineer and a you know uh, you you're not going to become a- adequate to those conversations just by getting on Google for 10 hours and, and deciding what you think is really going on. Right. Mm. Um, and it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, Elon Musk, it doesn't matter if you're me, it doesn't matter. Like there's no, like there's no level of education that qualifies you to be an omnibus polymath in an emergency. Right. And again, I'm not, and I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't ever, Learn as much as you can, you know, on a deadline about an important topic. That's fine. But I mean, t- to take this down to a very local case, you know, it's like, what do I do when I have a health emergency in, you know, personally in my family, whether it's me or, you know, someone mm-hmm. I love, right? I am not someone, I have a PhD in neuroscience, right? So I, I know, mm-hmm. like, I can read medical journals and I can, yeah, I can, I could get into the weeds there, but I'm, still not an MD. I'm still not a, uh, somebody who's had decades of clinical experience. I'm still not someone who, before this moment, was as a professional responsibility reading medical journals on this topic. You know, let's say someone's got you know, a problem with their kidneys, right? And okay, how much do I know about kidneys? Not a whole hell of a lot, right? So hmm. the, the, the question is, just, ha- just how good a use of my time is it to be to consult, you know, Doctor Google, uh, day after day, trying to become even more intelligent than the best specialists I can tap on this problem. Right? Just how skeptical should I be of my doctors or my wife's doctors, or you know, when we're in an emergency? And now, unfortunately, we have seen a you know we've lived through a dress rehearsal for a for a much worse global pandemic with COVID where our institutions failed us because they were operating, you know, for a variety of reasons that you will know, you know, take several books and dissertations to figure out, but we're living in a hyper politicized environment where social media has fragmented everything. And we have, you know, warring cults of, of, uh, you know, highly politicized, uh, people, um, uh, creating an immense amount of noise. Uh, we had a president, you know, who, uh, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, you know, it'll, it'll sound partisan to some people. It's not at all partisan to say it, who was deeply unqualified, uh, you know, to, to be president, frankly, but certainly unqualified to speak, you know, with any, anything remotely like wisdom about COVID as it was kicking off, right? This mm-hmm. is a, a president who was telling us we we got 15 cases and it's going to magically go away. Um, uh, so it's um, it was a perfect storm of of you know bad incentives and you know panic uh, and so it's understandable that people think what are you going to trust your doctors now really after what we've seen after we you know after Anthony Fauci. Uh, you know, it's called everyone racist for, you know, worrying that this might have come out of a lab, right? Like, like it is, it, it is understandable that, that people have been, you know, been so disillusioned with medicine mm-hmm. and with the pharmaceutical companies and with uh, academic journals that um, saying that you should trust the experts is, is, you know, a, a, a laugh line now, but we have to get back to a world where we trust the experts because there is such a thing as expertise. 
Right. And yeah. when you when you get on an airplane to fly across the country, you don't want to be thinking that maybe you should be doing your own research about how to fly this plane, and maybe the pilot's not qualified, and maybe and and, and may, it's like that's of course that's a disaster, right? And we and and so the unraveling of our trust in institutions and experts has to be rewound somehow, and we have to build back to a more normal situation where there's there are institutions that we by default can basically trust um where that would that have not become hyper politicized where we don't have i mean this is you know touches many other topics but you know where there's a genuine meritocracy at the bottom of all of this so you know that the people who are in, in those jobs are not in there just because they're they're you know redheads or or you know over six feet tall or mm. of one race or another right and it's like we, we there's a there are many perverse aspects to what to to the ingress of politics into our um our institutions which uh, we have to figure out how to fix but that that i think is the project and i don't and if we could do that then i'm not as skeptical as it sounds like you are about the possibility of just delivering good information and and gatekeeping frankly, in the ordinary ways, like just judging that certain people aren't worth talking to. Alex Jones is not worth talking to, right? You don't have mm. to platform Alex Jones just to, to get to the bottom of what he thinks happened to Sandy Hook, right? And there, mm. there are Alex Jones level figures, of the, you know, who are, who strangely are, you know, in the U.S. US Congress now, right? Yeah. Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene's view of election fraud is not a mm. view of terrestrial reality. Right. She is an Alex Jones like confection of a derangement of our politics. And mm -hmm. so you don't. Yes. You like I, I get I get that there are people who love her and who voted for her and will think uh, the fix is in if you don't talk to her. But mm -hmm. she the, the reason to talk to her, frankly, is to is to discredit her because she's she's such a dishonest broker of information. Right. She mm. and she's just I mean, she's frankly nuts. I mean, she's someone who's talking about a Jewish space laser starting fires in California. Right. This is mm. this is not someone who should be anywhere near our government. And so she's someone who should be talked about much more than she should be talked to. And the, and, and unfortunately, it's a, it's an invidious thing to say. But on any given topic at this moment. Vast numbers of Americans are the functional equivalent of 9-11 truth conspiracy theorists on the topic of, you know, of, let's say Trump uh, on the one hand, I'll give you the two topics you you gave me, Trump mm -hmm. and, and election fraud and, you know, to perhaps to a lesser and lesser degree now, but at, at a certain point, you know, COVID denialism. Hmm. I think that the, the, uh, the element, the absence or presence of good faith to me seems to be the, seems to be the critical sort of uh, question there um, on some real level. Now, look, I mean, Al Alex, Alex Jones, from, from my vantage point, it seems that you're dealing with somebody who's either, you know, in bad faith or not in his right mind, perhaps, or, or, or both. That's at least the, right. the impression I sort of obtained. Um, if, if I had the impression of Alex Jones as being somebody who was, you know, perhaps as, as wrong and, and, and dangerous, destructively wrong as, as, as he is, or seems to be, but was also coming from a place of sort of genuine sincerity, sort of in, in the pursuit of, of truth, uh, in, in spite of that. I think I probably would be tempted to speak to Alex Jones because I would operate under the assumption that, well, he has his audience anyway. Uh, it's not that Alex Jones is important, but the millions of people who he speaks to are, right? Because these are folks mm -hmm. who they not only vote, they're not just our neighbors and friends in society, but they're people who, if they are convinced as any other human beings might be, might, might lean towards doing if they were similarly convinced that society was actively seeking to destroy truth, to marginalize and oppress them, and that their country was being was being uh, uh, destroyed from from the top down, from the inside out. These are people who are liable to do things that you know would place them far beyond the reach 
of reason tilts us towards, you know, physical conflict. And that's the trajectory I fear. Uh, and so, you know, if Alex Jones were a good faith uh, uh, interlocutor, as wrong as he might be, uh, my hope would be that I might be able to engage an individual like that uh, in a, let's see, let's see the, you know, the problem with is an just, adequate structure and sweat uh, and setting to allow for the sort of parallel kind of you know contrasting of of narratives and understanding to allow people to begin to track the plot. Right, I think that there has to be some confidence in the idea that all things being equal, and they're frequently not equal, but all things being equal, truth does have some persuasive power. Right. And then we have to get to the point to where that can be allowed to sort of shine through. But it does require the person on the other side of the uh, of the dais, so to speak, uh, to be somebody who's committed to that truth project, right? But I'm, I'm I'm wondering if that that resonates or not. Most of these people aren't. I mean, it's you know Alex Jones, Donald Trump. You know, there's a very long list of of, of influential figures. Sure. And, and I'm not really talking about I'm not really talking about them. Right. But this is this is half of America. Mm-hmm. I mean, Alex Jones is probably not half, but at his peak, he, you know, there, there's had to have been 20 percent of America who thought he was in some to some degree credible. Um, mm-hmm. When you're talking about Trump, it's it's, to, you know, close to 50 percent of America think he's credible. I mean, the election lies 66 was it 68 percent of Republicans think the election was stolen in 2020. So these are these are truly mainstream convictions, and yet they are um, they're not tracking. They're not disposed to their their agents are not disposed to track the truth. I mean, this is you can't call these good faith uh, derived worldviews, um, mm-hmm. and it's impossible. You know, I, you know, I you just have to admit that I mean, there's there's every version of this. There's there there are people who are are in principle unpersuadable across any time frame right they're just you're never going to persuade them then there are people who mm-hmm. are potentially persuadable but not in real time not within that you could, even the longest podcast is not long enough to get them to admit that they're wrong by the end of it but maybe you know some years after the conversation uh, or some uh, you know some days after the conversation ran its course they're going mm-hmm. their their views going to be modified um, then there are people who, uh, you, you know, are just paragons of intellectual honesty and no matter how long and stridently they've been committed to a thesis, if you show them one, you know, you know, little, uh, flaw in it that is, mm-hmm. you know, truly destructive, you know, that runs all the way down to its foundations, they'll, you know, they'll just, you know, shake the stand up and shake your hand in front of a vast audience and say, thank you for, for correcting me. You know, you're, you're, uh, mm. it's, it's amazing that, it, that I was in the dark for this long. Right now that, you know, final case is the ideal of intellectual honesty and, and the scientific method. Right. I mean, that's mm. what, you know, right. in science we claim is possible. You don't see it mm. in, in real time very often. Um, mm. but it is in principle possible. And, um, that's what one is always hoping for that it's like no matter how far apart two people are if you just get them to collide in good faith with with access to all of um the relevant facts someone is going to see daylight right because there is a zero sum contest here well and and it doesn't even in order for it to be a for it to be a productive conversation, I mean, from the vantage point of somebody who, you know, say you're, you're seeking to persuade the other party of a certain point of view, if it's a public sort of dialogue, the thing that's important about the other party here, in, in my mind, is not, again, so much the individual, but rather the fact that, you know, the individual is the gatekeeper to sort of a larger, mm. larger group, right? And it does seem to me that, you know, when you get folks sort of in a room observing two individuals in dialogue, you know, the, the other person, the person on the other side of, of the discussion of the debate, you know, is going to have sort of multiple sort of uh, uh, motives potentially for wanting to hold fast to a position. I mean, you know, you, you, you want to be in good faith. You both want to be pursuing the truth, but you also have an audience. You also have a reputation. You also have the nervousness of wanting to perform in the moment. But for people, who, but for the more sort of, you know, interested, but but more purely interested on the basis of their engagement with the subject 
matter at hand uh, audience that surrounds the conversation. Mm -hmm. Those are the folks who have the opportunity from many different angles to see the interplay of ideas, right? And so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm sort of advocating, advocating for sort of maximizing the opportunities that we can find, again, where we can find good faith interlocutors and who represent even the most controversial or damaging positions that are also mainstream within some considerable segment of society, because that's practically speaking why we would need to have these conversations, um, that it should be a part of our project towards uh, rehabilitating the culture of, of you know, I say persuasion, but ultimately just democratic functionality, you know, to be able to find opportunities to engage with gatekeepers like that for the purposes of not engaging the gatekeeper, but the people on the other side of the gate. Right. And um, I guess I'm now I, I coming from something of a grassroots sort of uh, vantage point here, I guess, at the level at which I operate in our work at Brave Rangers, I feel like we do find people who, you know, don't have you know, Alex Jones size audiences or Louis Farrakhan size followings or whatnot, who nevertheless may represent, you know, and those are, again, being very extreme, but, you know, all along the continuum represent points of view that may be erroneous or damaging in any number of ways, who are also coming to those points of view because, you know, they're subject to not just an information diet, but a social and a cultural sort of experience and a narrative of understanding with respect to what authorities are trustworthy and credible and on their side and who are not, who nevertheless seem to, if you dig beyond all that, have some desire to actually get to where, where the truth is and would like to not hate the other side if they, if they could only believe that the other side didn't hate them, right? And so, again, I, I guess I'm, I'm pushing towards trying to recast the project here a, a little bit in terms of building out this network of relationships, but it seems that you have to find people who can open the door to folks who are caught in these points of view. And those people, by definition, who can open those doors are themselves who are people who are also going to be subject to, you know, occupying worldviews and positions that, you know, are the problem. But it becomes uh, important then to sort of differentiate, you know, between, I mean, as Dr. King said, and, you know, this is, this is, you know, you know, sound theological, so let's take it metaphorically, but, you know, to differentiate between, you know, evil and people who happen to be caught within the forces of evil, right? And uh, again, I'm not, I'm not making a theological claim that people are or are not evil here, but just to make the point that there is a differentiation there to be observed, and if we can manage it, uh, you know, and move the project in the direction of sort of finding good faith interlocutors who can authentically represent these perspectives, but also enter into dialogue. That's a phenomenon that I'd like to, I think, see scaled up. And that's kind of part and parcel of the project that we're committed to as a means of rehabilitating social trust before the lack of it kills us, basically, in terms of, mm. you know, the functioning of our society. Yeah, I, I don't think we disagree about the necessity of, of uh, expanding the conversation as much as is useful. I mean, we want to increase social trust. We want to converge on a fact-based discussion of what's actually going on in the world. And yeah. uh, we want to be able to uh, converge on some kind of hierarchy of shared values where we can prioritize what we spend money on, what we spend attention on, what we, what we respond to first. Uh, I mean, it's all, uh, again, it's a massive coordination problem and persuasion is a necessity. I'm just, uh, it's, you know, I think I'm more um, either skeptical or 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 um, realistic uh, than you are, depending on on what's true. Um, mm. That we can cast the net quite as widely as you seem to think we can. I mean, I, you know, you, whether you and I differ on mm. just who's worth talking to, you, we're both going to have to make the judgment that certain people are beyond the pale. You know, it's just it's not mm. fruitful to talk to person X because he's a proper maniac, right? Who's just going to lie as freely as he breathes, right? And sure. um, so that person's not worth talking to, even if he has a million followers or 10 million, right? Or he's worth talking to only to try to discredit and embarrass in real time so that his followers see the flaw in following him, right? And that, that's a totally mm -hmm. valid project. It's just rarely the case that I think I'm the right person to do it. 
right? So like, if you're going to, if you wanted to talk to a, um, I mean, this, for instance, this, this is why I didn't talk to um, Brett Weinstein or, or any of, um, you know, many of his other, many of the people he was interviewing, the doctors who were, uh, you know, claiming that millions of people were going to die from the vaccine uh, or, mm-hmm. or had already died from the vaccine. We're in the process of dying from the vaccine and um, that ivermectin was a perfect cure for COVID, right? Like, so that, that, that discourse was, was, you know, really popular over there in, in podcast stand. And uh, many people thought I should engage it, but the, the right person to engage it would have been a panel of, of uh, immunologists and virologists and epidemiologists who could have called bullshit every 17 seconds on these guys as they confabulated their way to, you know, to the land of nonsense as they were doing. Right. And there was an Alex Jones level, uh, uh, kind of piecemeal, uh, uh, approach to establishing certain facts, uh, which is very, would is very difficult for one person to counter in real time again because there's this asymmetry, right? It's just it's so much easier mm. to make a mess than to clean it up. You get Alex Jones on your podcast and you say, "Well, Alex, look, you know this this whole Sandy Hook th- thing is is um, you know really scary, and it's pretty obvious that this this really happened." And so I, and then he interrupts you. He says, "Well, what about the um, uh, what about the 17 people who called into the DOJ? You know, within 14 minutes of of gunshots being heard." And they said that they saw, you know, right. and he just starts talking, right? Of course, these are the first, this is the first time you're hearing any of this. You can't respond to any of it, right? He's almost certainly yeah. making it up. And uh, in in view of his audience, not having a response to that, not having heard of the 17 people who called the DOJ within 14 minutes of hearing gunshots, um, mm. you're an ignoramus. You're not you're you're, right. you're now no longer credible. So the debate is over, and that thing that will happen a hundred times in an hour, right? Sure. And and it's yeah. the same thing that happens with nine eleven truth conspiracy theorists. It's the same thing that would would be happening on on ivermectin, you know, a year and a half ago, where it's like, did you read this study that came out of Indonesia yesterday that showed that four hundred people uh, took ivermectin? And no, I sorry, I didn't re- read the Indonesian study uh, that came out yesterday. Oh, okay. Well, then, what are we talking about here? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we're too far apart on on some of those details here, right? It, it is. It, there's there, there's an asymmetry. There's an asymmetry there that has to be recognized. And the, what's crucial is that audiences don't recognize it in real mm-hmm. time. Certainly, the captive yeah. audience of the uh, on the side that's being you know, the side you're debating against don't recognize it, right? Alex, anyone who's a fan of Alex Jones is is who's is so in the weeds on the the documented anomalies of the sandy hook uh in, you know in, in, information right where it's like okay there's this piece of footage there's a, there's seven there's a there's a, in the corner of this photograph you can see the license plate was it was from another state right why is there an yeah. iowa license plate in the parking lot on Half of these right. people are mm-hmm. mentally ill, right? And mm-hmm. their other half are just have too much time on their hands. And right. they have, and this has become a new religion for them. So it is, I mean, religion is perhaps the right analogy. You, what you're imagining, I think, is some process of, of dialogue that will reach so deep for people that it will deprogram of their religion. Right now, I've been in that game for a very long time. I've debated religious people of you know every flavor for for years. I mean, it's been a long time since I've done that um, uh, publicly, but it's you know it, for for at least a decade there, you know, a decade and a half. That was part of certainly part of my job, but it's. And I'm not saying it has no effect. Yeah, I mean, re, you know, religious adherence has has gone down a lot in in my lifetime, and and certainly the 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 withering glare of of public displays of rationality has had something to do with it, I think. Yeah. But it's almost never the case that in real time you are going to get anyone to admit anything. That no matter how cogent your points are, and and it's it's. 
when you're talking about um, again, the, the two examples you raised were were examples where there was there really was time pressure, right? There's something sure. there's mm-hmm. something about right. a pandemic, an emerging pandemic, and an emerging political crisis, where I mean, certainly when an election is looming, you know, um, or you know, a a peaceful transfer of power is not being accomplished, right? Mm-hmm. That entertaining certain ideas uh, as though there really is two equivalent sides on on this specific topic is just the wrong framing. And so I think, you know, again, I, I, I didn't avoid these topics. I avoided setting it up as a debate of two sides that have equivalent facts Mm -hmm. that need, that need to be allowed to collide. What I did is I talked to experts about these topics who I thought I did, you know, I performed this gatekeeping function where I thought, okay, this, this expert is somebody whose view who's going to have a, a, at least a first cut at the most credible available evidence and the most credible available views on whether there was a, you know, whether we had an election problem or right. whether ivermectin is the perfect antidote to COVID. And were you concerned? Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to yeah, ask, were you concerned in having those conversations uh, with those experts? Uh, but, you know, not, not inclusive of, you know, someone like, uh, Brett, uh, for instance, that perhaps you were not reaching the people who most needed to be reached uh, with that information. That is to say, the folks who yeah. are perhaps millions and millions of Americans most stubbornly enthralled to the other narrative. Yeah, but again, I, I, I am, uh, it, cu- it cuts both ways because you, I, I worry about uh, two things. It, it, it just wanted being a waste of time to try to reach certain people. Because I, I do think certain people are unreachable, you know, and certain people, by certain people, I mean, tens of millions of people are currently unreachable on these topics. And mm. they will, what will happen is they will be, they, their infatuation with certain bad ideas will just run its course and then they'll no longer be, they'll no longer be thinking about those things. They'll move on to other things. And yet yeah, they'll never, they'll, there, there will never be a reckoning as to why they were wrong. They'll never admit they were wrong. Right. So, mm. um, you know, and so, you know, again, things like nine 11 truth is a, an, an example here, like the people who thought, who, who were spending every free moment going down the rabbit hole of nine 11 truth, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I presumably are no longer doing that. They may have found a taste, very likely many of them, even most of them have found a taste for another conspiracy theory in the meantime. But the, very, I would imagine very, very few of them have recognized that they were wrong about that and have apologized to all the people they bored to tears. And there hasn't been a, there's not a satisfying moment where people change their minds and come back into the light on these issues. And I think it will be with, uh, you know, on many of these other topics, it's just going to kind of go away. It's like, it's like the satanic panic in the eighties, you know, that mm-hmm. for, in the eighties, yeah. many, many people thought that children by the tens of thousands were being molested and even murdered by satanic cults. Now, sure. what happened yeah. to all those people? You know, what happened to the people who, who believe that, who believe they were pursuing this as a problem journalistically and, you know, at the level of law enforcement. And then we, we, at a certain point, we just kind of forgot about all the satanic cults. And, and now we think then there never were any satanic cults. But I didn't, I missed the moment when all the therapists who were doing, you know, regression hypnosis on people and mm-hmm. finding that they had been abused by satanic cults. I missed the moment when they all came on television and sorry, and said, sorry, guys, you know, we got that wrong. And we were using methods that, that were just pure suggestion and made no sense. And it was deeply irresponsible. And it was professionally, it should have been professionally suicidal. and. I'm mortified that I was ever a part of it. You know, I mean, maybe there's, maybe somebody said that, but there should have been yeah. thousands of people saying that and it never happened. Right. And, and so, you know, the blast radius from those erroneous, erroneous perspectives is, is also quite a bit more contained in some sense. Right. I mean, if you believe that, you know, nine 11 was an inside job, I mean, obviously that, that look, that's, that's a, uh, that is a point of view that, you know, represents a deeply undermined, you know, faith in our society and your fellow man to be sure. But yeah, but it was 16 percent at the time. I, the last poll I saw was 16 percent of American society. Believe that. 
according to Gallup, I believe. Right. That, and that's staggering. But with, let's say, you know, in the instance of voter fraud, 70% of the Republican Party believing that the outcome of a presidential election is illegitimate. And, you know, and to then have that sort of grow up into, you know, who we vote into office on the basis of whether or not they do or do not accept, right, the legitimacy of that election, putting people mm-hmm. in positions of power where they may in turn have an impact on policy and how things come about the next time, the next time around, you know, um, the, again, the blast radius of certain, certain beliefs is, is much more, you know, uh, much more damaging than, than others. But if we understand the problem of people's sort of uh, inaccessibility or uh, unavailability to certain points of view as being connected, I think, to this trust question, to how we're sort of networked together and our willingness to therefore give each other our attention in the context of reason discourse, you know, I think it resets the way we approach the, the problem. And I take your point about sort of the, the deeply embedded sort of existence many folks have in a sort of almost sort of religious narrative, sort of taking them out of the realm of what might be empirically true. And so you think, how much of this person's attention would I need to sort of move them out from this sort of worldview perspective? But I, I go back to sort of, you know, the, the only reason I would have mentioned the intellectual sort of, the intellectual dark web as, as a useful sort of model for what could be. Because, you know, I think about the conversations you and Jordan Peterson had, Joe Rogan, hour after hour after hour, people who spent 15 and 20 hours seriously having their perspectives and their worldviews, I think, shifted in, 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 in perhaps some, some meaningful ways in, in one direction or, or another because the social networking and the audience and the credibility that you folks had sort of across a, a wider spectrum, right, sort of allowed for that attention to be sustained over some longer period of time. And I guess, you know, again, a, a way to understand the Braver Angels project is that in a sense, we're kind of hoping to try and bottle that somewhat, you know, right. um, right. Not, not suggesting that that's a, a, an easy sort of thing, but that therein lies something of the, of the solution. Not saying we need a revival of the IDW, but that we need something that can sort of uh, approximate some of the good that came from that and some of what we learned was possible in terms of sort of stitching together a, a multipolar sort of, but somewhat for a time at least socially cohesive um, spectrum of the American people in deep reasoning based on some real, tr- some, some real uh, uh, bedrock of trust. So I'm mindful of the fact that we're at the, um, you know, we're, we're, we're at our time and, and I, I, I appreciate you being, being generous. I'm, I'm guessing you probably you probably have to make moves in another direction here. No, I can go a few more minutes, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I think I, um... but that's sort of the hope, you know, that, that something like that is, is possible. Yeah. I, I know. I, I, I share your hope. I guess I'm just trying to think of how I seem to be not getting on board with it for the purpose of this conversation. And I guess it's, um, I'm trying to figure out what has happened to my view of of this terrain because I mean so, something has shifted. I guess it, I mean w- one issue is I've had many conversations before on specific topics and and I've said everything I have to say about them. And then the question is, well, do I want to have this com- this particular conversation again? Right. So that's one mm-hmm. variable. Right. Like, how many times do I have to have this particular conversation? Uh, and this this particular some, conversation being the 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 IDW con- or just just any well no just 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 on anything I'm just I'm trying to okay, I'm sure. trying to figure yeah. out what like I I realize that in in this conversation I'm sounding like the one who doesn't believe conversation can work as a tool to get people to converge and I, I think I've been um. And it's not that I think that. I mean, I think it, I mean, because it is, the, it is really the only tool we have, except there's this other, there, there's this other feature of human life, which is we all just, other things happen and we all just move on too, right? So, like, I'm just imagining what would happen. Like, if, if you know, I, I'm not saying we're at this point, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen, but let's just say that mm-hmm. the Republicans, 
ran a a more normal presidential candidate in 2024. I don't know who that would be at the moment, but somebody who's not an election denier, someone who's just going to get back to the normal Overton window of of democratic politics, um, and uh, you know, ran hard against whoever the Democrats put up. You know, checked all the other Republican boxes that you need to check to be that Republican presidential candidate, but was just not a big lie Trumpist uh, who was uh, pandering to the to the the core base of the party. What would happen, right? And I think what would what very very well might happen is the whole big lie controversy would evaporate. Well, and let's say the Republicans won, right? So he, he he won as he or she won as the we get four at least four years of the, this new regime, but it's not a big lie. Uh, deep, you know, the deep state has corrupted everything, drained the swamp, uh, lurch back into Trumpistan. It's much more normal uh, Republican Party politics. Um, mm. I think that is that is a more likely corrective to the lunacy mm. that's happening on the right now, the, the QAnon inflected personality cult that is that is the, the, the Republican Party, in my view, or certainly the base of it. Um, I think that unwinds naturally there without anyone ever admitting even that they changed their mind. They certainly didn't get mm. argued out of anything. They just, right. w- they just won politically in, in the way that they wanted to. Um, and all of a sudden the energy they had to be, you know, t- worrying about a, a, you know, that, you know, Tom Hanks is a child raping cannibal, right? That just evaporated, right? QAnon is no longer a thing, um, mm-hmm. as if by magic. So was that persuasion? No, it was not an instance of persuasion. It was just the, the. The, the the conditions that were 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 driving the 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 mania and the moral panic and the and the confirmation bias and the disordered thinking got removed uh it got mollified and we had we magically found ourselves in the presence of more normal human beings uh and right. that's that's that so I, I i hold out hope for that sort of process more in this particular instance then I hold out hope for the process of getting, you know, a, a, a 20 Trumps of diehard, you know, Trump and QAnon supporters in a room and presenting a uh, and, 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 and basically creating a, a sufficiently compelling psychological experiment of deprogramming and trust building that you manage to get to daylight with them. Like, because well, it's, it's just yeah. I, I just don't see I. You know, I would love to be wrong about that, but I just I mm. I don't see it being a likely, you know, cognitively and emotionally, I don't see it as likely being possible. Right, and I guess perhaps the 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 difference in intuition here is that it, it's difficult for me to imagine how we get to the place of sort of a return to political normalcy, uh, you know, without. Um, passing through some cultural sort of, you know, shift underpinning that that allows for that, because even more conventional politicians ultimately have to interact with the social psychology of their constituents, right, left and center. And there's a demand pull that determines the supply so that even if you have somebody who in another era would have been, you know, would have been sort of a, you know, a, a, a conventional sort of political figure. If they have to tap into a certain zeitgeist, they become a part of that zeitgeist. It, it, seems, it's, it seems to me, and, and part of the reason the gravity there I think is so strong is because the social economy uh, around, you know, sort of changing, uh, uh, you know, cultural, um, uh, trying to avoid the word pathology for some reason, just to sound generous, but you know, uh, that there, there suddenly becomes, um, gain to be had in moments of desperation where distrust is mounting as societal problems mount, 
And suddenly, you know, the, the current of social movement picks up a life of its own. Politicians don't tend to steer that exactly. I mean, you can kind of catch it. You can ride the wave. You can amplify it. And, you know, I think Donald Trump is somebody who tapped into, you know, things and, and, and then sort of, you know, turned the dial up on it. And he's, he's a unique phenomenon in, 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 in so many respects. But it's just to say that I don't think we can skip the part where the culture changes on the road back to, to normalcy. I'm not immediately sure what I would look to as an example of that. But, but what I would want to offer as a, as a historical episode that might at least be sort of illuminating with respect to where some of my hope comes from uh, is the, you know, and this is a different scenario, but uh, I take a lot of inspiration from the nonviolent movement uh, as, mm-hmm. as led particularly by Martin Luther King Jr., the societal change that was affected in a deep cultural way, uh, and it was a change in which many people did indeed find their, their minds changed. Now, it, it doesn't negate your, your intuition about people sort of not admitting when their minds have changed, right? I think society and culture changed quite a bit uh, in, in the 1960s and going onward from that racial relations uh, in a way that really sort of pushed out of, you know, mainstream acceptability, this idea that some races are superior to another, and that white people are, you know, uh, by nature, more moral, ethical, entitled to greater rights and so forth. And I, people, I think, who were, you know, commonly held that perspective, didn't tend to overnight just say, geez, you know what, I was wrong this whole time. But there was a national catharsis wherein I think many, many people felt embarrassed about having held that point of view and suddenly became much quieter about it. And suddenly that perspective sort of began to sort of recede into pockets and corners. And obviously it's not, you know, totally eliminated by, by any means. And I'm hopeful one day you and I can have a conversation on, 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 on race because there's so much, uh, so much necessary territory to be investigated there. But I think that that was a cultural that that really was sort of a a, a normative uh, you know cultural movement that um, you know Dr. King and others helped lead that was aimed squarely at rehumanizing our relationship to one another across these racial and ideological divides in a way that I mean King's language was literally this he he said uh, as I'm fond of quoting him as 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 having said that you know we seek the beloved community. Uh, we seek not to defeat or humiliate the white man, uh, but to win his friendship and understanding uh, so that we may be reconciled to one another, right, uh, in this beloved community. And the approach there was to sort of, well, on the one hand, fervently making the moral and political case uh, for a society of true equality, also sort of relentlessly sort of humanize the people who are caught in the psychological grips of racism. And I believe that that allowed for some social psychological permission granting to begin to sort of take seed in the, to be sort of seeded into the soil of, of various parts of the country that, you know, didn't just shoot up into, you know, mighty oaks of enlightenment right away, but that grew over time and more quickly than you might have imagined. Uh, because that approach was so effective. Yeah, I think it's a different. It's, it's a. I'm not. I'm not sold on the analogy. I think it's a different case because it was not a the, the 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 gulf between white and black America in the '60s was not the result of different a different factual understanding of of what happened on a given day in November. Mm, sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Or the a different factual understanding of of the efficacy of certain you know molecules uh, that you know you may or may not take uh, to ward off a virus say um, so it it wasn't something that was debated away right so mm-hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't principally debating white people and showing them to be mistaken in their racism right and mm-hmm. I mean there there are instances like that I mean you look at at James Baldwin's de- debate with William F. Buckley, right? Like that's there, yeah. there are moments of, of debate mm-hmm. uh, that that were uh, certainly instructive and important, but for the most part, it was just the moral force of 
not yielding to bigotry and stupidity, right? And and then once that gathered enough energy, although you could have attributed that to to black nationalists and more militant, I think parts of the movement as well as being similarly unyielding, but not similarly right. Mm-hmm. And just but but nonviolent protest. I mean, nonviolent protest had moral force. I mean, just for white for racist white people to have to mm-hmm. see images of dogs and fire hoses being trained on nonviolent protesters, right? Mm. That is just so lacerating. And it's, it's such mm. an ugly, you know, funhouse mirror to be held up to your norms, right? right? And, and so just, just what are you defending if you're mm. on the side of, yeah, what we need now are more dogs and more fire hoses, right? Mm. Is that yeah. a, and, and yes, this little black girl shouldn't be allowed in our school. Right. Like and to see the little b- black girl walk up those steps, you know, to desegregate a school um, that has moral force. At it, but it, it's not an argument. Right. It's not mm-hmm. talking to Alex Jones so that his his followers will will hear you knock down all of his bogus points about crisis actors at Sandy Hook. Right. Um, right. It's not talking to Donald Trump or to to, to Steve Bannon about, you know, oh, what about the pallets of of uh, ballots that were, you know, found, you know, next to a dumpster in mm-hmm. Arizona, you know, Maricopa County. So like, you don't even want the phrase Maricopa County on your lips on this topic when you're talking to mm-hmm. those guys, right? Because it's just, it, 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 yeah. no, nothing good can come of it. Um, and... But, so it's a different, I think it's a different moment. And, and so the analogous thing that what you're describing that happened with civil rights is more analogous to what would happen if, um, if just certain changes, certain changes in, in what we did brought obvious benefits, right? So like, because there are two sides to it. Obviously there was the, the, civil rights movement side of the civil rights movement. But then there was also just the good things we got from being more integrated, right? There's just right, right. people laughing at, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, that the person who comes to mind is, is, is someone like Bill Cosby, you know, who's had, had his own uh, problems of late. Yeah. But, you know, mm-hmm. if, if in, you know, 1972, you know, you think Bill Cosby is the funniest person on earth, just how racist are you going to be in 1972, right? And um, so all of that was happening, and it wasn't. It was, it was an applic an amplification of human solidarity over mm. argumentation, and and that's um, yeah. Right. Well, uh, y- yes, I think that you're you're right about the meaningful differences, but I think you're also pointing at the meaningful similarity, which I'm trying to sort of uh, crystallize here. And uh, and, and just to, to try and be as clear as, as I can be, um, it, it's true that, you know, sort of oriented this, our conversation here around the importance of conversation mm-hmm. sort of out in the world. But my, my argument is that that you know, because we talk a lot, you talk a lot about conversation. I do too, and that's highly relevant to the to the larger social conversation over over facts and 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 you know how they permeate the membrane of those who don't want to receive them. But my whole argument is that that functionality is based on you know the the, the deeper presence of of social trust, which itself I think can only flourish if we are beyond thinking of one another in purely stereotypical or tribal terms. We have to humanize, right? Um, And so it is on that level, I think, that the nonviolent movement achieved, you know, an advance in the integration quotient in in society because it it shifted things on that level. The, the, The point of being able to get to where we can debate in our current time effectively and constructively on voter fraud or, or, or vaccines or any other thing, I'm saying that that tends to be the, the, sort of the center of of of, of our focus uh, in the way we tend to talk about um, m- much of this subject, and it is an important part. But the thing that I think I'm I'm trying to sort of lift upward in 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 the frame here is this idea that but we have to start by humanizing one another across 
these social disconnects, right? We, we have to reestablish sort of the social fabric of mutual humanization so that the trust can be there so that we can then move to the point of, of reasoning. And I guess that I'm, you know, in pointing to, to, to Braver Angel's work, describing that project and engaging with yourself and others, sort of on a little bit of a campaign to say, you know, let's, let's reallocate some significant portion of our intellectual energies and our social capital and our, and our ability to reach larger audiences towards, you know, this, 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 uh, this project of being able to sort of um, reestablish trust on the basis of persuasively, you know, showing people to the extent to which we can, that we are not one another's uh, enemies elementally. I mean, we, we, we may find ourselves in adversarial positions on the basis of the fact that competing, you know, perspectives, and maybe one is very much from truth, one is very much informed by misinformation, you know, these conflicts matter, and there's got to be sort of, you know, a winner and, 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 and a loser in, in, in elections and arguments of this kind. But that nevertheless, you know, it, it'll be a pyrrhic victory for, for either side if we're not able to come to the point to where we have rehabilitated this, this fabric of trust and social connection. So then the question simply becomes, how on earth do you do that? And, and, and that's why, you know, I, you know, try and put on the table that, you know, the pieces about, you know, the, the, the heterodox sort of social networks, you know, how did, how was it possible that we were able to bring people together from across all these perspectives to where they could sustain intellectual attention in part because, People were willing to attribute uh, goodwill, integrity, and social trust to influential people like, you know, yourself and Shapiro away on the other side and various people in between, but that that then extended to your followers from different parts of the spectrum. And, you know, for that one brief shining moment, you had this sort of Camelot thing that dissolved. But can we learn from something from that in a way that allows us to, you know, to, to sort of scale that? phenomenon uh, up in our own time. And, and again, I don't want to make too much of the IDW example. I, I go back to the nonviolent movement because, you know, I see that as being, again, meaningfully different in, in innumerable uh, ways on the level of detail, but ultimately being a highly salient historical example of how it is that sort of, uh, you know, something of a transcendent enunciation of our of our uh, mutual sort of you know human connection can create social and psychological space for a revisiting of 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 the legitimacy of deeply held prejudices and bigotries right um i feel like there's a lot to be learned from that and in any event i don't see any any more plausible sort of solution uh just just because I, I, I don't see it as likely that we're just going to get a return to normalcy through sort of, you know, entropy. I, I don't see it as terribly likely that we're ever going to go back to sort of establishment Republican and neoliberal 1990s kind of, you know, um, kind of, you know, um, uh, well-functioning sort of status quo, because the underlying social energies and, 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 and beliefs have become so radicalized. Um, I think something similarly radical in a constructive direction has to happen on the cultural, uh, in, in the cultural soil. And I'm trying to come to the place to where we can begin to sort of imagine together just what in the hell that might look like. Uh, and so, I, 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 for, for, forgive me, because I know it doesn't afford of an easy response, but, but that is what I'm, that is at least the picture yeah. I'm trying to paint for us to begin to engage it. Well, you might be right that something radical has to happen, and uh, I'm not sure what the shape of it would be. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, the, the way I try to build trust intellectually, at, at least, is to to point out again and again that I, I'm fundamentally not tribal, right? I mean, right. I'm simply going yeah. wherever I think intellectual honesty is leading me. So, you know, th yeah. there are very few people on earth who, who uh, are as critical of, of Donald Trump and his influence as I am. And yet, it's also true to say that there are very few people on earth who are as critical of, of wokeness and, and the, the far left arrangement as I am. I mean, I, I can, I can, I basically, um, I'm aimed in both of those directions. So no one can accuse, mm -hmm. no one who, who doesn't like me on Trump can accuse me of being captured by the far left because I'm simply not. And no one who doesn't like me on the far left can accuse me of being 
a trumpist because I'm not. And um, and there's a and this gets this becomes very fine grained because you know yes I think you know I, I I could speak for hours and hours about what's wrong with Trump and yet much of what the left thinks is wrong with Trump is is mistaken, right? Many of the mm-hmm. allegations of racism yeah. against Trump, I consider false allegations, even though I think Trump is racist, right? So I, you mm-hmm. know, I, I, I have very mm-hmm. little doubt that Trump is actually racist, but much of what is said from the left, and I mean, I mean even the mainstream left, much, is, much of what you'd hear about Trump on CNN or MSNBC is just obviously dishonest and unfair, right? Well, and, and can I say one of the one of the persuasive things about your credibility in this direction is not only what you've said, but the fact that, you know, you've also said, and I, I referenced this, I think, in, in a, one of my articles recently for USA Today, but you've actually expressed some solidarity with many of Trump's supporters on the basis of sharing a number of their political and, and uh, number of their political and social concerns over things like the yeah. rule of law and immigration and so on and so oh, yeah. forth. Yeah. And, and I, I think that you do still have a, a degree of uh, credibility with some of those folks on the basis of the fact that anybody who's listening closely enough can, can see that you're not dehumanizing all of their concerns across the board, right? It can yeah. be harder for folks to hear that nuance when the headline is, you know, down on, down on Trump, but those points of a connection matter. No, I, I probably agree. I agree with many of their concerns. Yeah. I mean, in many mm-hmm. cases, I probably agree with most of their concerns, you know, yeah. so it's not, it, it's, um, but there are just, there are some bright lines here that if you, if you're on the, if, if you're on the wrong side of this specific line, there really is not much more to talk about, right? So, yeah. and, you know, there, there, there are lines with respect to Trump, there's lines with respect to far left craziness, there are lines with respect to religion and science. And, you know, I mean, if you think that the universe is 6,000 years old and the Bible is the perfect word of the, uh, of the creator and it's perfectly inerrant, right? Um, okay, mm-hmm. if, that, if that's non-negotiable, if you don't want to hear anything that, that disparages that claim, Okay, then it's going to be a very short conversation. I've had those conversations. I've had public debates around all of that. But if that's a truly unmovable object, we got a problem, right? Now I can be nice in the green room, you know, like I'm not an I'm not an I'm not an asshole. So it's like we're, we it's, I can I can be totally friendly to someone who I'm going to debate yeah. on that topic, uh, and I can mm-hmm. feel compassion and love, and we can talk about other things. And how are your kids? And you know, isn't it isn't the weather great? But for the purposes of, of persuasion, if if that claim is unmovable, well, then it's uh, nothing of substance is really going to happen. And there there are analogous things with with the topics we're touching here. So it's um again, I do hold out hope that there are things out in the world that will push people around and will change things. I mean, I think we got very unlucky. Take take it back to COVID for a second. In one way, I mean, we got very lucky that COVID wasn't worse than it was, right? You know, it could have been much, much worse. It could have been 10 times as deadly or, or, you know, 50 times as deadly. And we would have, we would have lived through, or many of us wouldn't have lived through something truly awful. But um, mm. had COVID been worse, you know, uh, just enough worse to really get our attention, to really be undeniable, we would have had a different political conversation around it. There wouldn't, there wouldn't have been the same kind of vaccine skepticism. Brett Weinstein would not have been releasing 80 straight podcasts on the dangers of the vaccine if a few variables were changed. I mean, just, just take that, leave COVID exactly as it is, but just make it preferentially dangerous to children rather than to old people, right? You just flip that mm-hmm. around, the, the, the variable of age. If kids were dying by the hundreds of thousands from from COVID at a rate of whatever it was, you know, one percent, say, um, mm-hmm. but if it was pretty much all kids, we we would have had a very different experience, right? And right. and the patience that there would have been no fucking patience for vaccine skepticism, mm-hmm. right? And we everyone would have recognized that this is not my body, my choice. This is 
you're not going to kill my kids with your with your ignorance, right? And uh, you change one other variable. What if the vaccines actually really did block transmission much better than they in fact did, right? And there was a moment mm-hmm. where it was only rational to expect them to block transmission. Turns out they don't don't do it nearly as much as we would hope at this point. Uh, they just shorten the window by, by which you know during which transmission is possible. Uh, uh, if they're even doing that now, I don't know. But um, let's say the vaccines really did block transmission, but then nothing else was you know all of the other mishigas about how you know untested they are and how dangerous they yet might be and the spike protein and blah 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 leave all that in place just give me a little more transmission blockage and give me kids being preferentially killed or or injured by yeah, this this right. disease that it the, the obscenity of much of what uh, w- w- was said what much of what was said about COVID at the time at which it was said, you know, the 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 conspiracy thinking, the platforming of people who were obviously unwell and unbalanced professionally and mentally around around mm-hmm. vaccines uh, and their skepticism, the patience for that would have been non-existent, right? And so we so in, in some sense we got unlucky. Uh, at how benign this was and how mysterious it it could yet seem because yeah you could you could run the argument well did he die from covid or with covid he was 80 years old mm. right um yeah. we you know that was the situation we were in i'm saying that there 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 are changes in the real world that could have happened and could yet happen that would be would have been immensely clarifying Right. And mm-hmm. there just would have been no there would have been no less is the just at, I'm just asking questions routine would have not gotten anyone anywhere worth going. Right. And that's um, I think there. Are, so, you know, to part of what we're talking about here is, you know, with respect to Trump and with respect to covid are just contingent facts of these you know unique situations, which had they been a little bit different. um we would we wouldn't have fragmented in the same way right you dial up the you dial up the risk of covid you know or if if covid just had been you know just made you physically ugly right like if like if, if covid was monkeypox <laughs> right and you had pustules cool. on your face yeah. right yeah okay uh-huh. that's that's different than the hypothetical experience we all had of yeah. you know, do i is it a cold is it a flu is it covid who knows you know, yeah. you know mm. like we just I'm not saying I wish for those things because those are pictures of 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 a worse you know worse suffering for people. But had those things been in place, um, I just don't think we would have witnessed the same kind of shattering of our society around this particular variable. And um, again, so I, I pivot back to the possibility that if we could get a more normal Republican candidate who was not a you know not at the center of a personality cult built on misinformation. Um, mm-hmm. you know, that it, there could be a, a swing back to something more recognizable, uh, that doesn't seem like a social emergency. And I, but I, I grant you that I do feel like we are in the presence of a social emergency. Uh, it's mm-hmm. just, the question is, could it, could something other than talking about it be the process by which we overcome it? Mm-hmm. Something other than talking about it. Well, I agree with you that if we tweak a couple of things on the uh, on the COVID front, it's a radically different sort of picture. It almost reminds me of the point that you make about Donald Trump, that if he were only uh, half as bad, he would seem 10 times worse because it would be sort of closer to the realm of normalcy, whereby you could sort of yeah. evaluate him right, yeah, yeah. In, in that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been dancing around, you know, whether or not to, uh, to ask you a uh, Particular question here, just because I'm sensitive to personal dynamics, and and if you want, we could even excise this, Sam. So just just mm-hmm. know that. But um, but an, but an honest like pure point of curiosity I have here, um, because you you mentioned Brett a few times, and and Brett I I know uh, I know him well, you know, mm-hmm. pre- pretty darn well at this point, and um, you know, in my heart of hearts, I was one of those people who was hoping to sort of see you guys you know engage in dialogue because like like most of both of your followers i don't you know consider myself to be you know truly 
qualify to sort of evaluate some of the differences between you guys, except that I would have some optimism in that direction if I could hear sort of like the two of you sort of in dialogue. And I recognize the fact that there are experts who are more directly sort of engaged in the relevant field than either than either of you. But my greater hope that, that you would prefer to see uh, engaging with, with Brad or somebody who was skeptical here, but my greater hope would have been that, you know, if there were a good faith relationship between the two of you, which I think, you know, myself and so many others felt that there was, right? Um, you know, could that not have yielded sort of a structure of approach that would have ensured sort of the integrity of the dialectic such that even if there were points that were not resolvable in the moment, that by the two of you coming together with the relationship that sort of you were thought to have and that your audiences sort of had, you know, collectively, that we could have sort of, and I say we just because I was kind of one of those, you know, I was one of those those people who identified with that that space, right, over over all that time. You know, could we not have handled that in a way to where we could have done just sort of what you and him and Peterson and others did over the course of successive conversations on other admittedly less immediately sort of consequential topics, whereby we could have had a thorough exchange that brought brought everybody to the table in the audience across from the spectrum of, you know, credulous to the incredulous or, or, or what have you. And where there are points at which, you know, immediate resolutions to certain disagreements could not be found, there, it would be understood that there was a relationship that existed there that would allow for a returning to that subject, you know, maybe with Rogan in the middle or maybe with, or maybe not Rogan or some, some appropriate Christakis or some appropriate interlocutor such that we become collectively habituated to the ongoing deepening of the dialectic in a way that meaningfully sort of, you know, consolidates our ability to reason together through the two of you guys to start with, or, you know, or some similarly interchangeable figures precisely because the rarest sort of, uh, the rarest sort of element here that would typically be absent in another context if you were bringing in a panel of more, you know, relevant experts is present here. And that's actually the quality of social trust, you know, social trust from the audience going in both direction, not just, you know, one group of partisans, Sam Harris partisans here, one group of Brett Weinstein partisans here, but a diverse audience that actually has respect for both figures and, you know, a sense of a sense of solidarity sufficient to sort of allow for that process to unfold in that way. I think that's what I was hoping for you know, and, and other yeah. folks. And, and it's not to like try and make you feel bad or this, that, or that. I understand, I, I feel like I have a deep sympathy with, with the position you found yourself in, but just as we find ourselves in this moment where we've got a couple more years till 2024, the world, you know, we, we, we dodged a bullet last time, it seems to me. It could easily possible that things could go in a very wrong way, you know, in a worse way next time around. Yeah. Um, you know, this is the lightning in the bottle that I think at Braver Angels we're kind of trying to re recapture. And I, I'm just wondering, in retrospect, do you, do you think it's possible that something like that could have happened that would have worked? Not probable, but possible. Well, yeah, any, I mean, anything's possible. I, I just think I can tell you why it didn't happen from my side. I mean, I was not. The COVID was and, you know, the, the, and vaccine boosterism was not my hobby horse. I think I did. Sure you know, a couple of podcasts on COVID early on just to try to bring on relevant experts to figure out what the hell was going on at, you know, at each stage at which it seemed like there was new information. Uh, mm. but, you know, I brought on a guy uh, from Johns Hopkins very early, like just, you know, when, you know, it was kicking off in March, I believe it was in March of uh, 2020. And then, um, you know, I brought on a few other experts, you know, uh, uh, talk about just to inform the, uh, the audience. Um, but this really was, you know, Brett got this bee in his bonnet around, you know, skepticism with respect to the vaccine and, um, and, and faith in the efficacy of ivermectin. And all of that seemed so, fringe to me that um 
it see it just seemed not worth entertaining, right? And so, like, I so the yes, mm-hmm. the trust is there. I, I like Fred a lot as a person. Um, you know, he has he has a surprising he has his he has a taste a degree of 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 uh, taste for conspiracy thinking that I mm-hmm. I don't think I appreciated, right? And which this fit mm-hmm. this slotted right into. Um, so I see this, you know, not to diagnose him, but I see a kind of symptomology of, of that in him. Um, whereas, I mean, it's familiar to me from other, other, you know, other examples. Uh, mm-hmm. and the fact that he did, I don't think I'm exaggerating. He did something like 80, a hundred podcasts in a row all on COVID, right? What is that about? That's, that's bonkers to me. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's uninterpret, it's uninterpretable to me in terms of like that, mm-hmm. that, that given who he is as an intellectual and given his expertise in one area and his lack of expertise in this area, that that would be the thing he would do 80 to 100 podcasts on. I mean, it's just, you know, there's so much else to be interested in, worried about, convicted of, you know, like it's it, it, it was that's a symptom of something on his side right now. I'm sure he's got a story to tell about why he did that. But at the time he did it, to the degree he did it, it all struck me as colossally irresponsible, right? And mm. guaranteed to get people killed. I have no doubt people died as a result of his efforts to just get to the truth, mm. right? Like it's, it yeah. may seem like a mm. harsh thing to say. It is just an, uh, based on just pure statistics, it seems like I would be, I would bet, I'd bet everything I own. And I would just double, you know, double or nothing you know, that that's the case. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, so that was, you know, I I just didn't want to interact with that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to torch a friend, um, publicly more than I did, but I, it felt completely irresponsible to let our friendship, uh, keep me from saying something, uh, critical about it. So I said some minimal, minimally critical things about, you know, what he was doing over there on his podcast. And, um, and I brought on some people to, to counter message a little bit, but I did, I didn't really, I didn't see the, to dig, to dignify it with a, as a debate seemed to play into the irresponsibility of it. Um, Mm -hmm. And what's more, I just don't think it would have worked. First of all, I I just freely ad- admitted at the time that I was the wrong person to have that debate. He was the wrong person on his side to have the uh, the debate. I mean, it's just he, you know, I, I it made no sense to me that that it was him doing that. But even if he wanted to put himself up as the person to represent the vaccine vaccine skeptic point of view, um. Again, you need immunologists and and yeah. virologists and epidemiologists on the side to, of debunking all of that. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's also deeply unfortunate that our institutions and our scientific journals covered themselves in shame all the while while that was mm-hmm. going on. Right? You got you know people, you got epidemiologists by the thousands signing letters that you know black lives Mo- protests are okay black lives matter protests are okay and and right wing protests aren't you know so, yep. as if by magic yep. um mm-hmm. and so yeah i mean so so brett so in the center of that storm brett set up shop as a debunker of everything institutional but th- this case this this taste for contrarianism is its own pathology i mean the contrary mm-hmm. the the non expert contrary position is usually wrong right? for good mm-hmm. reason because you just have to look at the you just have to look at the 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 meaning of those words right i mean like if you're going to go against the consensus of the people mm-hmm. who have taken the time to understand a certain domain of facts and if you live outside that domain as a non-expert you know mm-hmm. you are you know you're the house is usually going to win there you know you're you're playing mm-hmm. a game of roulette Right. And in this case, we're playing a game of roulette with people's lives. Uh, so I, I viewed it. I mean, it's, I did view it as irresponsible. I still view it as irresponsible. It may yet 
proved to be retrospectively less irresponsible than I had every reason to believe it was at the time. I mean, so let's say, let's say five years from now, we learn that ivermectin is actually perfect, right? Just for whatever reason, the studies we had back in 2020 and, and, and 2021 were, were poorly run, but you know, we've, we did this perfect study and you know, ivermectin is, is perfect. And, the, and what's more, the vaccines, they're way more dangerous than anyone thought. And you, know, you, you don't want any of that, that uh, mRNA stuff in you. Um, right. So, uh, so Brett turns out he was right about everything, right? Um, mm -hmm. Will he be vindicated? Not really, because at the time, the re his reasons for thinking what he was thinking at the time were insufficient, right? His conviction at the time was 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 bizarre. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he literally called the, the the vaccine the crime of the century, right? And predicted that millions of people are going to die from it, right? If millions of people do die from it, it's still true that at the time he said that, it was a deranged and deranging claim, right? Mm -hmm. And it just made absolutely no sense. So um, anyway, I felt, you know, it was given the time, again, this is, comes back to the uh, kind of a time, you know, the time window is relevant because these things have, this has been a moving target all along. And I would, I, I would admit that, yes, if I had teenage boys in my house, uh, who I had to decide whether they should get the bivalent booster, right? Yeah, it's completely legitimate to do, do a a cost benefit analysis and and worry about myocarditis and uh, and that's you know that's I'm sure that I am not listening to his podcast these days, but I'm sure that's you know, Brett's bread and butter at the moment, right? Um, mm -hmm. We probably agree about that, but at the time, what he was doing. Okay, you know, a year and a half ago, I viewed as completely irresponsible, and I interacted with it the way that I that seemed to kind of split the baby as you know in as ethically as I as I could. And I, the, the truth is, I still don't know what you do um, when someone you have a a social relationship with, you know, however close. Uh, begins acting in a way, in a consequential way publicly that you view as, as irresponsible. And then, and Brett is by no means the only person who did this during COVID. Uh, and, you know, I mean, but between COVID and Trump, I had several friends kind of go crazy on me or as, as I, I view go, having gone crazy on me and done it in a public facing way so that they created actual harm. Right. And um, and Brett wasn't even the worst offender there, frankly. Uh, yeah. So it was um, I, you know, I, so and it was it was perfectly clear to me that had I not had any relationship with this person, right, had they been a stranger, I just would have gone hard against them, uh, you know, on my podcast and in whatever other channel I had access to, because it's just, it would have been absolutely, it would be, it would have been necessary, right? Like this, this, mm -hmm. this, this person is, is, uh, you know, this, this is Alex Jones, you know, but you know, you look at Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan's friends with Alex Jones. He invites him on the podcast mm -hmm. and yeah. decides to overlook the, you know, any, the, any disagreements they might have about Sandy Hook right now, you know, I'm very happy. I would never have been tempted. I mean, I, don't, I think Alex Jones is so far beyond the pale that I, I would have I would have navigated that quite differently from Joe. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, like that was an obvious, you know, I, I still don't under I, I don't think I have a position on the ethics of how you navigate moments like that, where you you are actually connected to the person socially they're a friend or they used to be a friend, you understand their personal struggles and they're doing something, they're, they're creating an enormous mess in public. And uh, mm -hmm. how you split that, you know, I, I, I think there, there are moments where you have to treat them as a friend and just kind of, you know, ignore ignore it and sit, sit that moment out as a social critic. But there are other moments where you have to just be as honest as you would be you, as if you, if you didn't know them and yeah uh, 
And it's, it's a hard moment to navigate. Well, you know, one thing I believe in in family dynamics is is surely as I believe it in in American life, and to to remove it from the Sam Brett uh, context here, and to just speak on the level of principle. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes your you know your wife or your husband may be the problem, but even while being the problem, they may also be the solution, right? What I mean by that is, you know, you may have uh, a spouse who's, you know. Uh, filling, you know, your kids' ears with all sorts of things that are, 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 are wrong and so on and so forth. And yet, you know, they've got a relationship uh, with your kid to where if you can just sort of, you know, find a way to reset the, the communication, you, know, you, might not only, you might be able to not only reset things with your spouse, but with your children as well through your spouse, right? And uh, I, I put it that way only to say that, you know, I think that we oftentimes think of our personal friendships in terms of their being things that are relevant in the context of our, you know, personal life and experience, but, but not always quick to recognize them as assets that can be, you know, leveraged in this greater sort of, you know, uh, project of needing to sort of build and, and rebuild social, social trust with a wider universe of people who are networked to us, particularly as public figures, right. And, and people who are, recognized as as leaders to whom people you know feel a a sense of connection and ascribe a great deal of credibility i mean it's difficult i'm by no means uh you know diminishing the 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 difficulties that you're that you're identifying here for all the reasons you you um you set forth but i but i do believe on some level you know you and i have um from what i can tell sort of precisely the same understanding of of free will um i actually would describe myself as sort of a, a religious and theistic individual, although, you know, of a certain kind, and that's a whole other conversation. Nevertheless, um, I think we both look at people as being, you know, uh, who they are, you know, not by choice, but that if by choice, only because their choices were not chosen, right? You know, we, yeah. we, are, we are creatures of the nature that we sort of inherit or, or, or are imbued with. Um, and as such, you know, it, you can almost relegate this question of, you know, how do we open people's minds and, and detribalize people to the language of a mechanical sort of sort of problem, you know, uh, we keep trying to fight our way through the intellectual door. And at a certain point, we've got to get there, you know. Um, but it seems to me that so much of what appears to be ideological rigidity, you know, at scale is also just social isolation and, 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 and woundedness and deep distrust uh, at, at scale. And, um, you know, being able to maintain uh, relationships that can allow us to sort of pry the door of trust back open a little bit. You know, it's a risk because obviously you, you therefore have to give airtime to perspectives that can be damaging. But if those perspectives are going to be swelling, you know, their their audience share anyway, just in just in bubbles and echo chambers that suddenly become impermeable to any sort of interrupting narrative intervention, then at some point I think it's got to be a risk worth taking. Maybe it's not a risk worth taking on the edge of the election or in the or smack dab in the middle of the pan, pandemic. I I think I can I, I, I can I, I can accept that there's a calculus to be rendered there that it feels a bit of a risk either way to me, but but I can I can see, you know, maybe maybe I too in, 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 in your shoes would have ultimately come down where you did at the precise moment in which you did. But as the risk diminishes, particularly you know, I mean, I sort of see America as being on a bit of a timeline here between now and 2024 as, as the immediate sort of risk diminishes, you know, coming out from from the, the heat of the pandemic and still being some distance away from the election. I do feel like, you know, we've kind of got to take bigger and bigger chances on some of these conversations in efforts to reach greater and greater numbers uh, of 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 people who otherwise are going to be inaccessible to us. And the only doorway towards doing that uh, is through through relationships that themselves are easily, you know, easily torn apart when when the pressure gets strong enough. And yet uh, we've got to we've got to build those 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 relationships. So mm. so the American people at scale can begin to rehabilitate uh, that social fabric. Right. Um, and so in any event, 
that at least is sort of the overarching kind of message and, and mission that I um, uh, come into this particular conversation uh, with um, as humble as I can possibly be before all of the complexity uh, therein. Um, but, but Sam, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. hoping you might be, you might be open to continuing the dialogue at some point and, and maybe jumping into some of the closely related. Yeah. Yeah. Books. There's more to talk about, no doubt. So yeah. um, best of luck. Yeah. And if you do wind up uh, going off into Trumpistan and, and uh, <laughs> Ivermectin land and persuading people by the millions, mm -hmm. let me know. I want to see the evidence of it. <laughs> I, I, I would be happy to be proven wrong on uh, all of those, all those counts. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I wish you the best of luck. Yeah, there you go. Well, Sam, uh, let's keep hope alive, my friend. And thank you very much for joining me on Uniting America. Yeah, good to see you, John. Thank you for listening to Uniting America. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it by subscribing on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a positive rating, review, or suggestions. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram and tune in for more content and learn more about the movement to depolarize America at braverangels.org.